spring break. I keep forgetting to put Edmund Spencer's name on the board. I've been mentioning him, and he's uh, among a handful of people who can lay claim to being the second greatest writer of Shakespeare's day. And I've been talking about his sonnets called the Amoretti, and I also mentioned his epic poem, The Fairy Queen, and we may refer to that. Uh, there's a fairy queen in Midsummer Night's Dream, so we may come back to that. That that was a term for Queen Elizabeth herself in Spencer's view. So uh, we'll uh, get to Midsummer Night's Dream today. I hope we'll still be talking about it after break. If you wanted to read as you like it uh, over break, it would be a fun diversion uh, on whatever you beach you may be at. So uh, uh, we're talking about the interrelation of politics and human nature in Shakespeare. Uh, in order to understand human nature, he felt he had to look at political life, and as we saw, he uh, uh, discovered or was able to uh, come to understand the phenomenon of Thumas uh, by looking at political life. By the same token, uh, it's human nature that creates the political problems as Shakespeare shows, and in some ways the fundamental political problems have to do with human nature. Uh, we saw that with Thumas, we're going to be seeing that with Eros. Now, in a way, these are the two irrational components of human life, uh, and they create disorder and threaten to disrupt political order, and you have to learn how to deal with them, as we saw with Henry V uh, and his spirited nobles uh, in uh, uh, Henry V. Now, uh, we're going to be looking at Eros over the next few weeks in Shakespeare's comedies. Uh, as I said, uh, the erotic aspect of human life Shakespeare finds pretty funny. Uh, it's what makes us look ridiculous. Uh, and we saw that in the history plays. Some of the funniest scenes in the history play involve men and women. Uh, the scene between Hotspur and his wife Kate, the final scene in Henry V between uh, uh, Henry V and his prospective bride, Catherine, whom he calls Kate, uh, uh, and uh, even that scene with Mortimer and his Welsh bride, some of the moments of uh, what we call comic relief in Shakespeare's histories involve erotic moments, and in that sense they prefigure what we'll be looking at in the uh, comedies. But first we're going to look at uh, Shakespeare's treatment uh, uh, of Eros in a tragic play, in Romeo and Juliet. And in some ways, this is more original. Uh, uh, as I said, the subject of young love was treated comically in the Roman drama uh, that Shakespeare uh, knew. I, I think he saw it as a challenge to take this material and treat it uh, tragically. Uh, and for that, I've been showing you, he drew upon this uh, idea of courtly love, which uh, his culture had uh, inherited from the Middle Ages, and which elevated love to a new spiritual status, which gave it uh, a religious dimension, or at least a quasi-religious dimension, which suggested that love was a dimension of life uh, that has a transcendent component, uh, and that can lead people to some higher life, to forms of redemption, uh, uh, can lead them to a kind of heaven. Uh, by giving such great importance to uh, love, this courtly love culture, uh, create the possibility of tragic love stories. And uh, again, our, our culture has inherited them. Story of Lancelot, Guinevere, and Arthur. Story of Tristan and Isolde. I noticed downtown on Washington Street, there's some I guess, musical version of the Tristan and his oldest story playing right now. And in the T, it says, of epic proportions, <laughs> this story. So uh, uh, you, it's the Middle Ages that gave romantic love epic proportions. Uh, uh, and Shakespeare drew upon that to create Romeo and Juliet, uh, even though, as I'm suggesting, he was critical of this and will eventually subject it to a comic critique as we'll start seeing in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, uh, but we were seeing last time uh, the elevation that Romeo and Juliet achieve uh, through uh, love. Now, Romeo starts out uh, with a more conventional Petrarchan love, more conventional courtly love. He's got this mistress, Rosaline, 
quite frankly, he doesn't know Rosaline from Laura. He, he doesn't know Rosaline. He's worshiping her from afar. Uh, and the whole emphasis is on her chastity, and therefore his chastity, because it takes two to tango. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of dead-end quality to that love. And that, that was always Shakespeare's sense of this courtly love in its literary form. Uh, it doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't lead to marriage. It doesn't lead to family. It doesn't lead to children. Uh, it's this static situation of the lover actually enjoying his frustration and his suffering and love. Now, Mercutio is in the play uh, to puncture the bubble of uh, Romeo's uh, Petrarchan love, or as Mercutio would put it, to prick it. <laughs> and all those dirty jokes uh, are an attempt to remind Romeo of sex. Uh, that his, Romeo's love life has gotten separated from sexuality. Romeo himself understands this when he talks about uh, Rosalind's obsession uh, with chastity. Uh, but this is what I was talking about in regard to politics. Again, that uh, medieval Christian politics created an ideal view of politics that was shadowed by a cynical and debased view of politics, that if you try to do something too ideal, you're going to fall into something uh, that's very corrupt and dubious. Same thing here, if you try to pursue a form of love that separates it from sexuality, that's not going to work <laughs> long term. And uh, Romeo's friends are all in favor uh, of hitting the mark, as Mercutio uh, puts it. Uh, so do understand that uh, the movement to his love for Juliet is a, already a modification of courtly love. There's something more active about it. It's moving somewhere, and they meet in a sonnet. It's not Romeo writing a sonnet to the distant Rosalind, which presumably she'll never read and will certainly never respond to. We're going to see that in Twelfth Night, that situation. No, when Romeo and Juliet meet, there's an interchange, and uh, it, it actually gets to the sexual stage pretty quickly uh, uh, via marriage. Uh, but nevertheless, this, the, this is already a modification, and Romeo learns that, uh, that he's got to find some medium, again, this is so typical in Shakespeare, between an extreme view of love as chastity and Mercutio's view of love as mere sexuality. Romeo wants to find a way to combine spirituality and sexuality in an active love. Now, again, Spencer and his Amoretti has suggested that can be done through marriage in some way. This parallels this. Let me just give you one poetic illustration of this in the play. Uh, if you turn to page 24, uh, 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 no, 23. Uh, uh, this is so Act 1, Scene 4, about line uh, 16. Uh, Mercutio, who's always trying to spur Romeo on, says, so again, Act 1, Scene 4, Line 60, uh, 17, You are a lover. Borrow Cupid's wings and soar with them above a common bound. And Romeo says, I am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers, and so bound I cannot bound a pitch above dull woe. Under love's heavy burden do I sink. Here's everything that's wrong with courtly love, Petrarchan love, with this purely poetic love. It weighs you down. You don't get anywhere with it. You can't fly. Uh, turn to page 38, and you'll see how different it is with the uh, love of Romeo and Juliet. So this is Act 2, Scene 2, uh, about line 66. Romeo says, With love's light wings did I o'er perch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do that dares love attempt. So now he's flying. In, in purely courtly love, he was grounded. <laughs> uh, but now when he's uh, achieved some kind of reciprocation, uh, in, in the love, the guy is flying, and that's the, the difference. There is an activity to this love that's very uh, uh, contrasted to the uh, passivity 
of his original very standard poetic pose of loving Rosalind from afar. So we saw this is a very uh, deep love. Uh, it energizes them. Uh, 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 it, it, it has this quality that overturns their whole world. I talked about the revolutionary quality of the love that it, it tries to invert the relationship between night and day much as Falstaff was talking about doing. Uh, this is everything I mean when I say that we're offering love uh, as the possible center of people's lives. Uh, and again, overturning any of the conventional hierarchy. And this leads them into a dream world, very much the world of the night, uh, uh, a, a world in which they reject the day, they get totally absorbed in, in, in each other. Uh, and I was talking last time about how uh, the, the dreamlike experience is desirable, it's what you dream of, yet it has this one catch to it uh, that it threatens to seem unreal, uh, the motif of it's too good to be true. Uh, and this is what I want to dwell on now and to explore that explore that further. Uh, let me set it up this way, that it, it seems thus far that what's going on here is that Romeo and Juliet are deeply in love, and as a result of that, they've got some problems, uh, they're forced, uh, 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 their love is countered to the wishes of their parents uh, on both sides, that in turn forces them to be secret about it and, and to pursue the love in secrecy. And it seems then that the love is primary uh, and things like the privacy and the secrecy of it and the hostility, uh, the, the conflict with the parents is incidental. Let me reverse that because <laughs> I think this is Shakespeare's very interesting psychology in the play. Uh, in a weird way, I'm going to say maybe what's primary is the desire to be pri private and secret. And the love actually follows from that. Now, that sounds paradoxical, but I think I can explain it. Uh, that is, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a way in which these two kids really are young rebels. And they enjoy that. Uh, they want to do something their parents don't want them to do. Uh, when I put it that way, you may recognize this perhaps in your own behavior or in the behavior of your friends, that there's, that, uh, there's something attractive to them about this sort of rebel, criminal life they lead uh, on the fringes of society. Uh, uh, towards the very end of the story, uh, so this would be page 114, uh, Act 5, Scene 3, about line 112, Romeo says he wants to shake, shake the yoke from this world-wearied flesh. Now, the guy is maybe 17, 18, and he's got world-wearied flesh already. But I do want to suggest, in a way, these young lovers are weary of the world. Uh, that's why I like the way de Rougemont not, uh, links up this kind of love with the Gnosticism of the medieval Cathars. Uh, uh, that a lot of this play flows from the fact that Romeo and Juliet are unhappy in this Verona. Uh, uh, Verona is not a very exciting place. Uh, it, for, you know, it, it's not at war. Uh, it doesn't offer young man, men that outlet uh, that Henry V's England does of, of going to war. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, it, it, it's a world of cowards. Uh, if you look at page six, uh, this is uh, uh, Act One, Scene One. Uh, you know, we're about to get a kind of West Side Story rumble here in the streets of Verona. So Act One, Scene One, line 50. And Samson says to Gregory, is the law of our side if I say I? Uh, uh, they're about to insult their, uh, the other gang, but he's worried if the law is on his side. That's not exactly a hot spur moment. Uh, and it comes up again on page 53. Uh, this is, would be Act 2, Scene 4. Uh, where Peter is supposed to be defending the nurse against Mercutio's insults. So Act 2, Scene 4, about line 165, 
If I had my weapon, should uh, I saw no man use you at his pleasure. If I had my weapon, should clearly have been out, I warrant you. I dare draw as soon as another man. That sounds like Hosper. If I see occasion in a good quarrel and the law on my side. This community is awfully lawful. Even the young toughs, most of them, want to be... Uh, uh, stay within the law and not fight. Now we have people like Tybalt and Mercutio and even, I would argue, uh, Romeo, who have a lot of thumos and end up killing each other uh, in the city. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, in political terms, it's a boring city. Moreover, it's ruled by old people. Uh, just the problem we saw in Henry IV, Part Two. The tendency of a regime, especially a princedom or a monarchy, that it's ruled by old people. Uh, and that's pretty obvious. We see it in Capulet. We see it in Montague. There's a lot of old people in this play, and they run things. Look at page 55. Uh, uh, this is Act 2, Scene 5. Juliet uh, is, is uh, waiting for Romeo and... She's, she can't wait till he shows up, and isn't time running slowly? Uh, and then she says, line 16, so page 55, act two, scene five, six, six, but old folks, many faint as they were dead, unwieldy, slow, heavy, and pale as lead. You know, that is a use attitude towards age. These old folks, they're virtually dead. And there is that sense in Romeo and Juliet that, that Verona's dead. It's a city of the dead. Uh, that uh, there's uh, uh, no excitement uh, in it for them. Uh, uh, and, uh, f for example, that means uh, they don't think the old people can sympathize with them. Romeo uh, is, uh, always complains, you know, you do, to the friar, for example, you don't, you don't understand me. Uh, you're too old to understand what we young people uh, feel. Uh, so there is this sense in the play that they're rebellious against Verona before they even fall in love. Or at least what I'd like to say is the love is very much conjoined to a rebellion uh, against Verona, that in some ways what they primarily want to do is rebel against their parents and the regime of the old in Verona uh, and do something exciting for change. And if it means uh, violating the feud, fine. The feud is a good example of what it means to be ruled by the old. This is an old feud. No one seems to know what it's over anymore. Why they're all these people know is Capulets fight Montagues and Montagues fight Capulets. And it's like they're locked in a pattern. Uh, that's become a pure custom in the city with no explanation to it. So I think Shakespeare understood something about romantic love uh, here. Uh, and again, it's not so much that you fall in love and therefore rebel against your parents. It's you rebel against your parents and in the process fall in love. Now this was wisdom shared by Jane Austen. And I want to bring up Jane Austen here because she's the most Shakespearean of English novelists and the great uh, heir of Shakespeare when it comes to romantic love. Uh, a lot of her novels are about just this issue and trying to reform a romantic notion of love, uh, especially the, the notion of love at first sight. Love at first sight works out disastrously in Jane Austen's novels. Uh, uh, you need like an eight-year probationary period. Uh, her, her novel Persuasion is all about that. Uh, but uh, if you know Pride and Prejudice, in, in, uh, the worst sign possible for, for Jane Austen in a potential marriage is that the two parties like each other from the beginning. Uh, uh, as in Pride and Prejudice, they got to have a lot of real problems with each other that they work out, uh, and then they're, they're, they're suited. Now, in one of her preternaturally early works, she wrote this when she was 16 years old. You've all missed your chance to equal Jane Austen on this, I suspect. Uh, it's called Love and Friendship. It's a little epistolary novel written in letters. Uh, and in the sixth letter, uh, 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 the writer of the letter is named Laura. 
I think Austin understood the connection to Petrarch here. And she's writing about a young man who showed up in her house and he's complaining about his romantic situation, that he's being forced to marry a Lady Dorothea. Uh, and what he says is, Lady Dorothea is lovely and engaging. I prefer no woman to her. He's talking to his father here now. But no, sir, that I scorn to marry her in compliance with your wishes. No, never shall it be said that I obliged my father. <laughs> this is so perfect that he's really, this woman's great. He wants to marry, but it, because his father has told him to do, he won't do it. Uh, and Laura reports, we all admired the manliness of his reply. Uh, that's the kind of perversity of romantic desire that Jane Austen explores and that Shakespeare explores uh, uh, as well. Uh, uh, and so you actually see at the very core of this love a desire to escape the social identity they've been given in Verona, and that's the whole point of Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Uh, that is, uh, if we turn to page 37, you know, this always misquoted line as if uh, Juliet is inquiring as to his geographical location. Uh, this is Act 2, Scene 2, about line 32. O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn by my love, and I'll no longer be a capulet. I'm arguing that what appears to be an incidental consequence of their love is really at the heart of it here. Now, what they want to do is escape from being Montagues and Capulets, because that's what imprisons them in this oh-so-boring Verona. And as she goes on to say, line uh, uh, 38, uh, "'Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor, nor face. O be some other name belonging to a man." Uh, in medieval philosophy, this would be called nominalism. <laughs> She's saying these, these names, they're just a matter of names. They're just conventions. And now think back to Falstaff. Remember, what's honor? Honor's just a name. And could honor can't set to a leg? The same thing here, or actually the scene uh, between the French princess and her maid. Notice here, uh, it is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face. You know, on the level of the body, uh, were not Montagues or Capulets. Uh, the political community imposes on us categories that have no basis in nature, that are purely arbitrary and we would say nominal. And so, you know, famous lines, a lot of famous lines in Shakespeare. I don't know where he got them from. Uh, line 43, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Uh, so the fact that they're trying to get by, uh, get by their names, I think reflects the fact that they're trying to get back the social identities that they find limiting and imprisoning. And note, this is when Romeo bounds forth, uh, line 49, I take thee at thy word, call me but love, uh, and I'll be new baptized. <laughs> and if, if, if anything points this connection between this kind of love and Christianity, here you see it. Uh, I mean, he uses a distinctively Christian term here for the experience. And notice it is the idea, I'll be new baptized. It is the notion, I'll get a new identity. This is a kind of Christian, it, it's, an, it's the romantic analog of a Christian conversion. Uh, it's how all these ideas come together uh, uh, at this point, uh, that they will be fr uh, uh, free of their social identities, will be li which have limited them, and they will achieve an unlimited love. The love will become the total focus uh, of their lives. Uh, uh, and th this is Juliet's uh, great hope as well, uh, that her love uh, might be uh, 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 infinite. Look at page 40. So this is Act 2, Scene 2, uh, about line 133. Uh, my love is as boundless as the sea. My love is deep. Uh, uh, my bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love is deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. Uh, this is their dream. 
and infinite love. It comes up again on page 59 where Juliet says, so th- this is Act 2, Scene 6, about line 32, they are but beggars that can count their worth. But my true love has grown to such excess, I cannot sum up some of half my wealth. Uh, notice, by the way, a kind of contempt for commercial Verona here. They're presumably both from merchant families, uh, and the sense is that's the world of counting houses and accountants and uh, bills and banks, and, and, and their love is infinite. It's not something that can be uh, tallied in a checking account or that you can get a bank statement of. They want to move beyond that to something that's infinite. Now, that's the idea that they inherit from courtly love. Uh, uh, that love can be infinite. Uh, and that's that sense it's, it's transcendent. Now, infinite, uh, <laughs> how do you measure infinity? As, as, as Juliet reveals, it's difficult. It's difficult to count up that high. Uh, but here's one way of measuring the infinite. Uh, it's more important than anything else. Uh, and that's, of course, their claim for their love. Uh, their love is infinite because there's no value elsewhere in their world that can be stacked against it. Uh, 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 you know, <clears throat> uh, three million ducats in the bank isn't worth their love. Six million ducats in the bank isn't worth their love. There, there's nothing worth their love. Uh, now, this is what makes their love so problematic, uh, that they wanted to have infinite value. Uh, you also see that they have the problem that uh, uh, they're worried it's unreal, that it may be just a dream. So they're under constant pressure to prove their love and to prove its infinity. And tragically, the only way you can prove the infinity of your love is to die for your lover. Uh, And here's where we get the tragic turn of this story, which in so many ways seems earmarked uh, for comedy. That the, the, the problem for Romeo and Juliet is that for them, love is to die for, to die for each other. Uh, they, they feel they have something to prove by dying. And this is, you know, Shakespeare says, watch out. <laughs> when you find someone who, who says, you know, I, I, I got to prove something by dying for it. That's the kind of political fanaticism we saw religion generate in the history plays. It generates a kind of uh, 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 romantic equivalent uh, of that uh, here. So again, I would say that uh, we have to reverse things. This looks like a story of fate. We're told from the very beginning, uh, which would be page three, so the prologue to Act One, line six, a pair of star-crossed lovers uh, take their life. Uh, there's this you know, suggestion throughout the play that this story is fated. It, it is just, you know, uh, it, it's a tragedy of fate. Uh, everything was ready to work out. Uh, except a couple of problems happened and they ended up dying. Now, uh, I, I would say that Romeo and Juliet create their fate. Uh, they are too disposed to die because they feel they have to prove something uh, uh, by dying. Uh, and so we see, again, we see this tendency a lot. Basically, their tendency is, gee, the coffee is a little cold this morning. I'd better kill myself. I mean, anything that comes along that thwarts them, they're ready to die. A uh, uh, couple of examples of this. Uh, 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 page uh, uh, 69, so Act 3, Scene 2, uh, about line 45. This is when Juliet learns that uh, Romeo has killed Tybalt. Say thou, but I, and that perverse eye shall poison more than the death-darting eye uh, of a cockatrix. Uh, I or those eyes shut that make the answer. I. She's she's ready to die if the news about Romeo uh, is true. Or on page uh, uh, 
uh, uh, 74, Romeo shows the same, same tendency about Act 3, Scene 3, about line 44. Uh, he's, uh, he's just talking about his exile, and he says, Hadst thou no poison mixture, no sharp ground knife, no sudden mean of death, though ne'er so mean, but banished to kill me, banished? Uh, o friar of the damned had used that word in hell. Uh, and, you know, he's just ready to kill himself uh, at the uh, notion of banishment. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 over on the next page, uh, page 75, and this is still Act 3, Scene 3, about line 65, notice he says to the friar, Wert thou as young as I, Juliet thy love, an hour but married. That's so typical. You don't understand young people. I've always spent a whole life listening to old people. And then his, and fall upon the ground as I do now, taking the measure of an unmade grave. This is morbid. Uh, uh, to, to take the measure of your grave already. And this goes on and on, page 89, uh, uh, end of Act 3, so Act 3, scene 5, page 89, line 245. If all else fail, myself have power to die. Uh, I'll give you one more example, but it's, it's all over the play. Uh, 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 this is act, uh, page 92 at the bottom, Act 4, Scene 1, about line 72. This is when the friar is proposing this plan for Juliet to take the drug. And he says, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Thou hast the strength, uh, if rather than to marry County Paris, thou hast the strength of will to slay thyself, then it is likely thou wilt undertake a thing like death to chai away the shame. And what does Juliet say, line 77? Oh, bid me leap rather than marry Paris from off the battlements of any tower. Now you see, it's been presented to her as an issue of strength of will. You know, he's basically, have you got any guts? If there's an ounce of heroism in him, you'll take this potion I'm going to give you, and she says, give it to me. Uh, uh, and then eerily predicts what's going to happen, or line 81, or hide me nightly in a charnel house, or covered quite with dead men's rattling bones. Uh, uh, here's what they get to prove their heroism by dying for each other. Uh, by the way, notice that Shakespeare sets up the ending so that uh, Romeo comes upon Juliet thinking he's dead, and commits suicide for her, but she's really not dead. She wakes up, sees Romeo dead, and she gets to commit suicide for him. It's actually brilliant the way Shakespeare creates it. Each one gets to die for the other. Uh, uh, and it's their only way to achieve heroism. I mentioned that last time we'll be seeing this develop in the comedies, that in this kind of frustrating world where there's no Political outlet for ambition. Uh, again, Verona's not at war. The young men just have to fight against each other in the streets. With no noble Henry V to lead them in battle against Mantua, uh, the Veronese here, uh, the world's boring, and the one way for this young couple to be heroic is to die for each other. And it's actually presented to them as a test of their strength of will, and they're very willful. Again, I would, I'd like to stress that, that uh, they're not just ordinary teenagers. I would like to give them some credit and some distinctiveness, and this is how Shakespeare makes them tragic. Uh, if this were just a story of a couple of crazy mixed up kids who end up killing each other, it would not be tragic in the deepest, profound sense. Shakespeare does give them a heroic quality. That's why he has to draw upon this tradition of courtly love uh, and why he sets up the plot so they are proving something here. Uh, and again, they, they need to. Uh, uh, precisely because they've pursued such a, uh, a distinctive course of love which is so private and intense. Uh, it's what gives their love uh, 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 its tragic quality. Uh, what makes it attractive to, to them. Juliet compares it to lightning. Uh, this is the scene, uh, Act 2, Scene 2, when they, the bal famous balcony scene, uh, uh, when things get really moving fast here. Uh, uh, they go from 0 to 60 in 12 seconds uh, uh, in their love. And starting at the bottom of page 39, so line 117, Act 2, Scene 2, 
Juliet says, I have no joy of this contract tonight. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning, which doth cease to be ere one can say it lightens. Sweet good night, this bud of love by summer's ripening's breath may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. Now, there's a very important contrast here that we're going to be seeing developing uh, throughout the comedies. The difference between a momentary and intense love that is destructive and hence unproductive and one that's slower, takes more time, and ripens. Uh, uh, Juliet's image for the alternate form of love is this bud of love uh, uh, that may prove a beauty's flower. That's going to turn about to be Shakespeare's comic love that we'll see in Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, a love for the ages, as we can say. Uh, a love that allows the lover's time, uh, allows their love to ripen. Uh, Romeo and Juliet wants something uh, much more uh, brief and intense uh, here. Uh, we see this uh, uh, again on page 113, uh, 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 where uh, Act 5, Scene 3, line 90, where, where Romeo speaks of lightning uh, uh, as well uh, here. Uh, it's the one way you can have an infinite love is in this one moment of intense experience which leads to death. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, uh, well, here's some other examples of it. If you look at the bottom of page 67, uh, so Act, five, Act 3, Scene 2, uh, Juliet says, Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds towards Phoebus' lodging, and so on. They, they just want haste in the love, uh, and that's that, uh, that haste that brings on, of course, their, their, uh, their uh, tragedy. Uh, uh, the friar is always cautioning them about moving too fast, but in fact, that's what they want. And uh, uh, what I'm getting at is the interconnection between love and death in the play. Uh, this courtly love stuff was famous for the idea of love death. Uh, in German, it's called Liebestod, uh, and we've got it in the Tristan and Isolde's story. Wagner's opera ends with this famous Liebestod aria. Uh, uh, the Tristan and Isolde myth uh, in uh, the German-speaking lands in the Middle Ages was even stronger in this regard than the Guinevere and Lancelot uh, Arthur myth. But it is curious that we see in these stories of courtly love uh, that the love ends in death. Uh, now I'm trying to explain the logic of that to you. It's the way the lovers prove to each other the, the depths of their love. Uh, but it also is a way of preventing the love from descending into the morass of worldliness. These people don't want a love in this world. They don't want the love that their parents want for them, to marry well and conveniently. Uh, the Capulets want a merger, basically. They want Juliet to marry someone who will be a good business partner for the family. Uh, and uh, again, you, you feel like saying it's, it, it's incidental, but no, they really, Romeo and Juliet really want a tragic love because they don't want to grow up. Uh, and just think of it, uh, let's say this thing does work out and Romeo and Juliet get married in the eyes of the city uh, and then they raise a family and suddenly they got 2.3 kids and they're living in the suburbs of Verona uh, and they're driving uh, the SUV to PTA meetings uh, and trying to get the kids uh, into college and all that stuff. That would be boring to them. So much better to die in a suicide pact. Now, Shakespeare sees what's you know, radically suspicious about this uh, and that it's not a way of life for everybody, for sure, uh, and how destructive this can be to a community if everybody lived out this way. Uh, but it is a tragic story because they're, they're holding up a kind of ideal here uh, that uh, 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 makes them admirable in the sense that they're, not, they're just not ordinary people. Uh, uh, now, 
part of it, another way you can see this is how they get into the as deeply into the love so fast uh, uh, as it is. Uh, and here, here is an accident. Again, it's the famous uh, 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 balcony scene uh, uh, that uh, is on page thirty-nine, uh, uh, where uh, uh, actually starting on thirty-six, thirty-seven. But why? Is this love so quick? The reason is that Romeo overhears Juliet's soliloquy. Uh, in a kind of cr crazy way, it's a violation of a stage convention, which points to the unconventionality of their whole love. That is, Romeo has an unusual, you know, he's there spying on her, and he hears her sh say how much she loves him. Uh, most of us don't get this opportunity. <laughs> you know, uh, takes six or seven dates to get to this point. Uh, uh, and indeed, what jumpstarts the love is this unusual moment where Romeo has access to Juliet's innermost thoughts. Uh, uh, normally, uh, we have a lot of conventions and customs in society to facilitate love, uh, to make communication between lovers possible, one aspect of that is to slow them down. That, that you know, again, some of these things are old-fashioned by now, but we've had new customs to uh, uh, replace them. But you know, when a, a couple announces they're going steady, or 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 when they get engaged, and when they finally get married, we have all these customs, really, to smooth the way for a man and a woman to get to know each other and advance towards marriage and learn that they love each other. Uh, suddenly, Romeo has this tremendous advantage because he, he doesn't have to wonder. Uh, uh, and, and, and Juliet sees uh, the problem. Uh, this is starting at the bottom of page 38, so Act 2, Scene 2, about line 85. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush to paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. She knows how unusual this is. You just got the drop on me. Uh, you know what I'm thinking. Fain would I dwell on form. Fain fade, deny what I have spoke, but farewell compliment. Dost thou love me? Now you see that fain would I dwell on form. She understands that normally love develops itself in forms. Those customs that a society has, courting customs, uh, we call it, notice the connection between courtly love and courting customs. Uh, all things coming out of the court. Uh, uh, and normally lovers have to deal with the problematic conventionality of love. That's what we're going to see as the great theme of Shakespeare's comedies. Uh, uh, on the one hand, conventions facilitate communication and love. They give young people forms that they can use to approach each other and not have to reinvent love every time. Uh, that's why literature is so important. People get their ideas of love from literature, now from television and movies, because they're seeing conventions, social conventions that define love and the stages of love. Uh, 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 and here, uh, we see that Romeo and Juliet can skip all that, and it's, it's problematic because, um, you know, on the one hand, the conventions can help. On the other hand, they do stand in the way. They do stand, they, they're, they're too conventional. This is something we'll be examining in Midsummer Night's Dream, that uh, 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 lovers don't want their love to be conventional. Every loving pair would like their love to be unique. Uh, and, and hence, the, no one else has ever felt this way before. Uh, the oft-repeated claim in human history, but every time it's no one else has ever felt this way before. And that's what Romeo says to uh, his friends, it's what he says to uh, Friar Lawrence. Uh, and they've indeed managed to escape formalities here. Uh, but you see the problem for Juliet, it was one-sided. Uh, Dost thou love me? Uh, and so she, uh, she has not had the advantage of knowing whether Romeo loves her. And so, so much of the play now grows out of the speed with which 
they've reached this point uh, uh, that they can't kid around anymore. You know, if you love me, we got to, well, in this case, we got to get married. Uh, but, you know, if you love me, we, this has got to be a real love. And again, that's why they have so much uh, to prove uh, to each other. Uh, and in that, that's how they come into conflict uh, with this uh, whole society of Ronas. So what we see here is uh, almost two ways of life. We're going to see them as the tragic and the comic ways of life. On the other hand, there's Romeo and Juliet, who stand for a unique experience entirely personal to them. They would like it to be cut off from all the customs of society, which they find old and boring, and they'd like to achieve this perfect love. Uh, uh, but its perfection is shadowed by the fear that it's unreal because it has no confirmation. Why do we have public ceremonies of marriage? It's in a way for the whole community to uh, uh, certify the love. Uh, you know, to re in a way to show, put the whole power of the community behind the love. Uh, and that makes it more stable and lasting and durable uh, and makes, gives it the basis for forming a family uh, uh, and producing the next generation. Romeo and Juliet are troubled by that prospect. They would like to go it completely alone. Uh, uh, and they're surrounded by this society that they find uh, boring. And Shakespeare goes out of his way to make it seem conventional. Characters like Capulet and Lady Capulet and the nurse, they are so crass. Uh, they are so conventional. They stand for such conventional values that we can see why Romeo and Juliet uh, uh, reject them. I think one of the most powerful moments comes on page 88 uh, when... Uh, uh, the nurse who's really been, we know, sweet to Juliet, raised her from a child, genuinely loves Juliet. Uh, uh, and so this is Act 3, Scene 5, about line 215. Uh, it really does not look like there's any way to get around this business with Paris, having to marry County Paris and Romeo being banished. And so the nurse, uh, in all the practicality of conventional wisdom, says at line four, 214, faith here it is. Romeo was banished, and all the world to nothing that he dares not ne'er come back to challenge you. Or if he do, it needs must be by stealth. Then, since the case so stands is now it doth, I think it best you marry with the county. Oh, he's a lovely gentleman. Romeo's a dishclout to him. An eagle, madam, hath not so green, so quick, so fair an eye as Paris hath. But shrew my very heart, I think you are happy in the second match, for it excels your first... Or if it did not, your first is dead. Or towards good he were as living here and you no use of him. And Juliet says, speaks thou from thy heart. Uh, this is a terrible and I'd argue heroic moment for her when she knows she's now standing completely alone. She has nothing else to turn to, not even her dear nurse. And, you know, the nurse, the nurse is offering a principle we'll see as the principle of Shakespeare's comedy, uh, substitutability. <laughs> If one man doesn't work out, choose another. There's always another one. Uh, obviously, for Juliet, that's completely untrue. There is only one man for her, just as there's only one woman for him. We are Romeo and Juliet. We are the tragic heroes of this play. But the nurse is living in a comic world where one man is pretty much as good as the next. And so do the practical uh, thing here. Uh, uh, so uh, we see the choice between uh, a unique life, a life of the purest individuality, of going your own way, of having your own vision of love, of not being dependent on your society, on your parents, on any sort of conventions, and a more ordinary existence, which sounds a lot more boring, but at least has the virtue of, endure, of enduring. Uh, and it's that old choice uh, we've talked about, Achilles' choice, the choice between living a, uh, uh, a quick life but a glorious one and a long life and an inglorious one. That's basically uh, the point that uh, 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 Romeo faces. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the one thing that makes this love possible is, of course, the friar. 
uh, and now I want to talk about the, the friar's role in the play. Uh, I, I say that because uh, Juliet, at least, is not going to consummate this love without being married. And the whole community is uh, against the marriage, but the friar is able to marry them secretly. Uh, uh, in that sense, the whole plot turns on the special status of the Catholic Church in this community. Now, uh, the friar is a character who's, who has been insufficiently explored. Uh, uh, the current issue of the New Criterion uh, has an article on Shakespeare's friars and showing how much Shakespeare loves these friars and offering this as proof that Shakespeare's Catholic. Uh, it's a very strange article, and I think it misses the whole point here. Uh, it is true that you know we see a friar in a play, and we're not too used to evil friars. Uh, I guess if you read Dan Brown, you would be. Uh, but but uh, uh, in Shakespeare's day, uh, uh, there was a great deal of anti-Catholic sentiment uh, in England, and it's manifested in the plays. There are a lot of evil friars uh, in Elizabethan and later Jacobean plays in England. Uh, uh, do remember in 1589, uh, the Catholic monarchy of Spain had sent an armada to try to conquer England and reimpose Catholicism on it. This did not make Catholicism too popular in the England of Shakespeare's day. Uh, uh, you know, by the way, this, has, this would have nothing to do with judging the Catholic Church today, which does not have military political ambitions. The Vatican isn't out to, you know, uh, conquer Italy or uh, take a war to France or something. Uh, but in Shakespeare's lifetime, uh, the Catholic Church was a major military and political force that linked up with the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, uh, in this regard, and as we see in the history play, Shakespeare is very... Uh, dubious about the combination of religious and military political power. And this, this friar is a very interesting figure in that respect, and I would say we shouldn't jump to think he must be a good guy because he's a friar. Turn to pay, if you've got the signet, turn to Roman numeral 50, wait a minute, 64, so LXIV. This is from uh, the preface to the main source for uh, Romeo and Juliet, a uh, poem by a man named Arthur Brooke called The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, uh, <laughs> he's very negative about Romeo and Juliet. Uh, to this end, good reader, is this tragical matter written to describe unto thee a couple of unfortunate lovers thralling themselves to unhonest desire, neglecting the authority and advice of parents and friends, conferring their principal counsels with drunken gossips and superstitious friars, the naturally fit instruments of unchastity, attempting all adventures of peril uh, for the attaining of their wished lust, using auricular confession, the key of whoredom, and treason for furtherance of their purpose. Now, this is not Shakespeare's attitude towards Romeo and Juliet. I'm not claiming that. Uh, he does make them the hero and heroine of the play. Nevertheless, it's interesting that in the source he worked from was a very anti-Catholic uh, uh, poem which talked about superstitious friars, uh, the naturally fit instruments of unchastity, and talks about confession as the key of whoredom and treason. Uh, uh, so, uh, I want to offer uh, a far more negative reading of the friar than I've ever, ever seen anywhere in print, uh, and I will start from the fact that he's introduced uh, in extremely uh, ambiguous uh, uh, terms morally. This is page 43 in the signet, so act two, scene three. Uh, when we first see the friar, he's putting around in his garden in a world where you can't tell medicine from poison. Uh, and so, for example, this is Act 2, Scene 3, about line 8. Uh, I must have filled this osseous cage of with baleful weeds and precious juice flowers. He mixes together baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers. Uh, uh, and then uh, he goes on to say, uh, 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 line 15, Oh, Mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. For naught so vile that on the earth doth live, 
but to the earth some special good doth give. Nor aught so good but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice sometimes by action dignified. Now, it's interesting, this article that appears in the New Criterion makes the big point here. Well, look, this is a guy who can turn vice into virtue. But I will say, by the same token, it shows he can turn virtue into vice. And on the next page, page 44, the very top, so about line 20, Three, within this infant ride of this weak flower, poison hath residence and medicine power. So we learn from his first introduction uh, that he lives in an ambiguous world of poison and medicine. And the same thing that can be medicinal uh, can also be poisonous. Uh, uh, and so then we get uh, his uh, plan uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, bring the lovers uh, uh, together. Uh, and notice that he's not all that supportive of their love. Naturally, I mean, he lives a life of chastity. He sees them as crazy young lovers. Uh, but he's willing to do this, and why? On page 46. So this is Act 2, Scene 3, about line 90. In one respect, I'll thy assistant be. Not in all respects. In one respect, I'll thy assist be, for this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household's rancor to pure love. That's his goal. His goal is not the same as the young lovers. Uh, he's actually going to use them for his own purpose, uh, which is to bring peace to Verona, to end the feud, and that's an admirable goal in many ways. It would be great for the friar, it give, would give him enormous power uh, in the city. Uh, 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 notice, by the way, from the beginning, uh, it's not particularly essential to his plan that Romeo and Juliet survive this. Uh, indeed, turns out it's much better off if they don't uh, to accomplish uh, uh, his goal. Uh, here. So, again, I, th I think Shakespeare's audience was trained to be suspicious of uh, Catholic friars uh, uh, on the stage. Juliet is suspicious of Catholic friars. Uh, page 97. Uh, she's been told, okay, you'll take this drug uh, and you will uh, sleep and uh, you'll be buried and I'll come get you and Romeo will come get you. Uh, page 97, Act 4, Scene 3, as she's about to take the drug, uh, line 24, she says, What if it be a poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he should be dishonored, because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is, and yet methinks I should not, for he has still been tried a holy man. You know, she, okay, I'll take it. But it's very interesting that this occurs to her. Uh, uh, she's not the most cynical, suspicious person on earth. Uh, yet she sees, you know, the friar's in a bad position now if this story ever comes out. Romeo's been banished, and it turns out he secretly married her, uh, uh, married him to Juliet against the wishes of the parents. Uh, this thing could blow up in the friar's face. Uh, and even Juliet thinks, well, maybe he just wants me dead. Well, she goes ahead and takes it anyway. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, we know the tragic ending. Uh, the uh, 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 friar uh, plan doesn't work, uh, and Juliet uh, uh, appears to be dead when Romeo shows up, and he kills himself. You know, I want to say that the friar is indirectly and directly responsible for the deaths of Romeo and Juliet especially in the case of Juliet. Uh, that is, uh, if you uh, uh, look at what happens on page 115, uh, uh, this is Act 5, Scene 3, about line 148, O comfortable friar, where is my lord? I do remember well where I should be, and therefore I am. Where is my Romeo? I hear some noise, <laughs> lady, come from that nest of death, contagion and unnatural sleep. Now, uh, okay, here's the situation. Uh, you're the friar. You come upon a 13-year-old girl uh, in a tomb 
who's waking up from a nar narcotic stupor and her lover is lying dead three feet away. What do you do? A, you try to comfort and console her and above all, try to conceal the dead body of her lover from her view. B, you summon her parents. You summon medical authorities to get her aid. C, you conceal all weapons of destruction like knives and poison from her. D, all of the above? Or in the friar's case, none of the above. In the friar's case, just get out of there as fast as possible. She's 13 years old. She can take care of herself. Uh, I mean, that's his behavior here. Uh, line 151, I hear some noise, lady. Come from that nest of death, contagion, unnatural sleep. A greater power than we can contradict hath swore our tents. Come, come away. Thy husband in thy bosom there lies dead. And Paris too. <laughs> Let's tell it, break it to her gently. Uh, <laughs> Come, I'll dispose of thee among a sisterhood of holy nuns. Uh, the Catholic solution to the problem, we'll see it come up even in Athens. Midsummer's dream. Stay not to question for the watch is coming. Come, go, go, good Juliet. I dare no longer stay. I ask why. I've never seen an actor make this at all convincing. I dare no longer stay. You should stay. <laughs> I mean, prevent her from killing herself. Uh, he has no reason for leaving except to save his own skin. And indeed, he is immediately suspected. Page 117. Uh, 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 so Act 5, Scene 3, Line 183. Uh, third Watchman, here is a friar that trembles, sighs, and weeps. We took this matlock and the spade from him as it was coming from the churchyard side. A great suspicion. Stay the friar too. Uh, and I, again, I, I guarantee there's a lot of evil poisoning friars uh, in the drama of Shakespeare's uh, contemporaries. Uh, and indeed, uh, page 118, uh, he says, a line one, uh, still act five, scene three, about line 223, I am the greatest able to do least. Uh, by the way, I noticed yesterday, that's an inversion of the Christian principle. Uh, the Christian principle, the least is able to do the greatest things, but he, I am the greatest able to do least, yet most suspected. Uh, 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 but he then gives a long attempt to explain himself, uh, uh, and his big excuse, line 262, but then a noise is scary from the tomb. He's easily scared. Uh, uh, and he realizes he's in trouble. Let my old life be sacrificed some hour before his time under the rigor of the severest law. And much like Juliet, the prince says, we still have known thee for a holy man. And lets him off. Now, I think this is actually a very Machiavellian prince here. Uh, he actually has gotten what he wanted. Uh, peace in his city. Uh, this is going to end the Montague Capulet feud. Uh, uh, he's gotten rid of some of the most uh, spirited and contentious young men in the city, including Tybalt and Mercutio, and even you can say Romeo, uh, uh, and he's now got the friar. <laughs> the friar, uh, he's got the goods on the friar. Anytime the friar tries anything else like this, he knows uh, he's a dead man. Uh, 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 the, the prince is, is, is very right not to confront the friar here or try to make an issue with this. Uh, the prince has what he wants. So it's a very interesting ending to the play uh, in that sense. And I would, you know, again, I, 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 uh, from the start, I've said this play turns on this peculiar uh, alliance between the friar and Romeo and Juliet. Uh, again, not a total identity of purposes, uh, a, a meeting of purposes on, uh, on one point for the friar, this will bring about peace. He is in many ways a standard stage uh, character in English Renaissance theater of the scheming friar uh, who doesn't listen, you know, doesn't care what 
the people of Verona want, what the capitalists and Montagues want. Uh, he wants to bring about peace and thinks he'll become a hero in the city if that does happen. Uh, uh, it doesn't quite work out as we planned. Uh, uh, as it, uh, he tries to, to get out of it, to just leave the scene and let other people deal with it. He's cornered, uh, puts the best face on it, uh, and the prince, I think, who has a long time to think during that long speech of the friar, comes up with this uh, solution. So, uh, what we see here uh, uh, is in many respects the model for Shakespearean tragedy. That is, at the end of the play, the community is brought together but at the expense of its most interesting figures. Uh, the community reestablishes itself, but on, on the level of mediocrity. Uh, Romeo's dead, Juliet's dead, incidentally, Mercutio's dead, Tybalt's dead. All the most interesting characters who made this play dramatic are dead by the end, and the community can only reunite because the truly passionate and interesting figures in the community, the truly dramatic ones, have been, in a sense, purged. Uh, they wanted to go their own way. Uh, they wouldn't accept uh, the conventional order of the city. That's what makes them tragic. That's what places them on a higher plane. But in the end, they are sacrificed to what amounts to the reunification of the city. Okay, that's a quick romp through Romeo and Juliet. Let me just get started on Midsummer Night's Dream so I can say I'm almost on schedule here. And we'll come back to Romeo and Juliet as we discuss Midsummer Night's Dream because I'm presenting them as, as truly a pair. Now, just very quickly, I want to say something about the setting of the play. It is nominally set in Athens, uh, but it's no Athens that any of us can recognize, at least not in ancient Athens. That is, there are nunneries in it, uh, the so-called rude mechanicals, bottom, snug, and so on. Uh, they seem awfully much like Englishmen. Indeed, the whole life in the play seems to be the life of an English country house. Some people think the play was written as a kind of celebration of a wedding at some English country estate. Uh, uh, it's a very English uh, play for something that's supposedly set in Athens. And as I've said, I think it's characteristic of Shakespeare's comedies that they are not set in a real historical world in the way the tragedies uh, by and large are. Shakespeare's history plays are about English history and have roots in actual historical material. That's pretty much true uh, of his tragedies as well. The comedies tend to occur in what I'll call a never-never land, a utopia, uh, in, a, in a way Midsummer Night's Dream takes place in a forest. You'll see that As You Like It takes place in a forest. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, Twelfth Night takes place in Illyria an unidentifiable political unit, but a world where, again, dreams can come true. As I've said, the comedies tend to abstract from the real world of politics in order to facilitate a happy ending uh, and also to allow Shakespeare to explore other aspects of life uh, uh, than he did in his histories and tragedies. It's almost he said, Let, let's, let's bracket out the normal politics and see where else people create problems, and it turns out to be in the world of eros, uh, uh, in the world of romantic love. In order to study it, he will, uh, for the moment, forget about the kinds of real-world political problems he explores in his histories and tragedy. Now, there's one exception to this rule, and that is The Merchant of Venice, uh, and I'd feel like an idiot if I didn't at least mention that. Uh, the Merchant of Venice is set in a real Venice. Uh, it's a very accurate uh, amazingly accurate portrayal uh, of Venice down to some of the uh, topographical details like the Rialto. It is noticeably the Venice of Shakespeare's tragedy Othello. They make a very interesting pairing. Uh, uh, it's the same Venice with the same problems of religion and aliens in the city and, and so on. Uh, uh, so, you know, any one of these generalizations needs to be qualified. I will say that insofar as The Merchant of Venice is set in Venice, it is headed towards being a tragedy. 
towards the death of a character, Antonio, perhaps towards the death of Shylock. Shakespeare has to get out of Venice to have a comic resolution to that play, and the last act is in a place called Belmont. Uh, not a suburb, but close to a suburb. Uh, Belmont, which Belma, a beautiful mountain. It really is, a, in its own way, a kind of utopia or no place or never, never land. So in some ways, even Merchant of Venice illustrates uh, what I'm talking about to the extent it's deeply set in Venice. It heads in a tragic direction, only taking it into uh, the sort of uh, comic never, never land of Shakespeare's comedies doesn't have a comic resolution. So uh, again, I say this because there are people who study Shakespeare as a political thinker, who try to talk about Shakespeare's Athens, for example, the way you know I've written a book called Shakespeare's Rome, and I take very seriously Shakespeare's portrait of Rome in his Roman plays. Uh, uh, he did write a tragedy called Time of Athens, which is set in an Athens a little more recognizable as Athens than the Athens of this play, but not all that much uh, the Athens we know of from history. Uh, well, again, there are people who try to discuss Shakespeare's Athens as if he, he has his Roman plays and his Athenian plays. I don't, personally, I don't think that works out. I may be wrong on that issue and I'm ready to be corrected. Uh, but uh, uh, what he see, uh, this Midsummer Night's Dream is set in the Athens of Theseus. That already makes it a mythical or prehistorical. Uh, Athens, Theseus, who's compared to Hercules and other figures out of Greek mythology. Anyway, I just bring that up to explain why I'm not about to give you some lectures on Athenian history as background to this play, because I, I personally don't see any connection. Now, the connection is with Romeo and Juliet. Uh, that is, uh, these plays looks like they were written at the same time. They are together the most poetic of Shakespeare's plays, the, the most uh, lyric poetry in them, more rhyme in them than in any other plays uh, uh, by Shakespeare. Uh, I do think Shakespeare set out to prove he could write a comedy and a tragedy at the same time, and indeed about the same subject, namely romantic love. Again, in some ways the challenge was to write the tragedy about romantic love, because uh, comedy about romantic love had been around since, at least since Menander uh, among the ancient Greeks. Uh, I don't know if he knew about Plato's Symposium and the end where Socrates says uh, the playwright who can write tragedy uh, can't write comedy and the playwright who can write comedy can't write tragedy. I would like to think Shakespeare did know that and he said, I'm going to prove Plato wrong. Here it comes. It's me, William Shakespeare. I'm going to write a comedy and a tragedy at the same time and about the same subject. If he didn't know Plato, he proved the point anyway, and as I've said, it's one of the most remarkable things about him, that he was as good at comedy writing as at tragedy writing, and I think we're going to start to see why by pairing these two plays. So, what's the challenge here of writing a tragedy and then a comedy on this subject, and why might Shakespeare have done that? Uh, is there, for example, a defect in the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet? That is, I've offered uh, Romeo and Juliet as a critique of courtly love and this whole romantic tradition that grew out of the Middle Ages. Uh, it really shows how tragic that view of love is and how catastrophic it is. <coughs> it leads to the death of these uh, beautiful uh, youngsters in Verona. It unhinges the whole city. Uh, you can almost say it takes it to the brink of civil war if the prince hadn't intervened <coughs> when he does at the end. Uh, 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 he shows how destructive this nature, this na notion of love is, and not accidentally destructive, but inherently destructive. That's why I've stressed that what we see is this isn't a love that accidentally resulted in death. This was a death-devoted love from the beginning. Death was the logical outcome of it. In order to prove this infinite love, they had to die for each other. Uh, and Shakespeare shows it's like lightning. It's brilliant. It's glorious, but it doesn't last. 
and you can bet no children, uh, no family. So I, I, you know, it's a tragedy. <laughs> the story is a tragedy. In that sense, it's a warning. It's a caution. Uh, uh, tragedy has traditionally fill, uh, filled this role, showing what happens when people try to exceed normal human limits and try something as unusual and glorious as Romeo and Juliet does. But has that stopped anybody from loving this play? Uh, has that it stopped generations of youngsters wanting to be Romeo and Juliet? This may be the problem with tragedy. Uh, that it shows us the tragic outcome of these heroes, but it nevertheless presents them as heroic. We look up to them. They are awesome. <laughs> we look at them with awe. Uh, and part of us wants to be like them. Uh, I, again, I find this amazing irony of the fact that Romeo and Juliet, Cervantes, Don Quixote, two attempts to criticize this idea of love, have been the means of transmitting it and keeping it alive to this day. Uh, and in these bastardized forms like West Side Story uh, and The uh, Man from La Mancha. Uh, this is a very attractive myth for reasons we've already looked at, but we'll explain more fully uh, in the course of Tony by Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, Shakespeare may have realized the defect of the tragedy that it makes us admire what it cautions us against. Uh, and you know, the obvious thing is you say, uh, we're gonna be Romeo and Juliet, but this time we're gonna get it right. Uh, uh, we'll time the meeting in the tomb better, and we won't have to kill ourselves. Not realizing that again, the inner logic of the love is to kill themselves. So if you wanted to criticize this notion of romantic love, make fun of it. In some ways, that's a more powerful form of critique. Don't make it look glorious but disastrous. Just make it look ridiculous. Uh, that's the way, you know, again, we, we, we almost instinctively think that tragedy is a higher form than comedy. And we want to say that tragedy is a more serious form than comedy. But I'll say in many ways, comedy is a more philosophical form than tragedy because it's more intellectual, it's more skeptical, it questions things. In some ways, tragedy uh, makes us look up to the, our great heroes uh, and uh, be cautioned by the disasters they face, but still to admire them. Comedy shows us our heroes have feet of clay, that they're not all that heroic, and above all, that they're not all that different from us. So comedy has this skeptical element that's fundamental to it. And that, uh, that, that I, th now again, I'm not <laughs> saying that Shakespeare repudiated Romeo and Juliet and he went on to write many, many tragedies. He never wrote another love tragedy quite like Romeo and Juliet. Uh, there's Othello, there's Anting Cleopatra, but very, they're very different and deeply political. Uh, so, and he, he starts to write a lot of comedies about romantic love and maybe uh, he, he got the message from Cervantes, you know, let's make fun of this stuff, not present it uh, as tragic. And so very quickly, because we're running out of time and I do want you to have spring break, uh, how do you make comedy out of this tragic material? You got this great tragic story of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, well, the answer is Romeo and Juliet and Ted and Alice. Uh, all you have to do is double your lovers. Uh, two lovers, tragedy. Four lovers, comedy. Uh, that's Shakespeare's genius here. Instead of Romeo and Juliet, we got Hermia and Lysander and Helen and Demetrius. When you got Romeo and Juliet, what we just saw is the uniqueness of their love, the extraordinariness of their love. They are these great figures. They're just teenagers, but there's something heroic about them. There's no one else like them. They proved something. They proved willing to die for each other. All you need to do is double it. And then suddenly the lovers don't look unique anymore. Tragedy points us to the extraordinariness of human experience. 
comedy points us to the ordinariness of human experience. They're complementary in that sense, and it's strange, but it's unusual that Shakespeare was the only person that could do both of these things. A good uh, indicator of this is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in Hamlet. In the middle of this great tragedy, we got these comic figures because we can't tell them apart. Uh, the characters within the play can't tell them apart. At one moment, when they're at the court, King Claudius says, thanks Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. And famously, the Queen Gertrude has to correct him, thanks Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. The king has gotten them confused, because after all, they're Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Uh, and, you know, one moment Rosencrantz is the gentle one, and the other moment is Guildenstern, and the point is, no one can tell them apart. They are completely ordinary human beings. Uh, they are not like Hamlet, uh, unique Hamlet. You get two guys walk out on the stage saying to be or not to be at the same time, and that's comic. Uh, and so, I think you really see, I, this takes us to the nub of the difference between comedy and tragedy, to see that what Shakespeare does here is offer us uh, lovers who think they're unique, but we can't tell them apart. Now, I'm a professional, and I've been teaching this play since about 1980, and I can tell you it's Hermia and Lysander, yes, and Demetrius and Helena but I'm not going to ask you that on the final because there's no way you're going to be able to tell them apart. In fact, the whole point in the play is they can't be told apart. Uh, so this is the shift from tragedy to comedy. Uh, we've seen Love is Travager and Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream. We're going to see what happens when the lovers are interchangeable. You can have a comic ending. For Juliet, Romeo accept no substitutes. This play is about accept substitutes. It doesn't work out with uh, Demetrius, uh, take Lysander. If it doesn't work out with Hermia, take Helena. This, that's the, the tragic principle is accept no substitutes. The comic principle is, yeah, accept substitutes because life is more important than any kind of principle. Okay, I got one minute. Arthur, I realized I rushed through Romeo and Juliet, but any, any questions? Okay, I hope you have fun discussing the play in section. It's a marvelous play. Okay, so have a good break. We will resume with uh, Mr. Wright's Dream, and we probably will get to As You Like It by that Thursday after break, but I'm operating about three-quarters of a class behind at this point, but I, I, can, get, I can get through at that rate. <laughs>